If we value the pursuit of knowledge, we must be free to follow wherever that search may lead us. The free mind is not a barking dog to be tethered on a ten-foot chain. Back in the late 1700s, early 1800s time period, there was a social movement liberating the modern world from the reign of control that religion and superstition had on the people. Essentially, after our darkest part on the procession of the equinox, we were really beginning to wake up. Started making new inventions that were rapidly changing the world. The industrial era was beginning. Because of this, we began to see that maybe religion as an answer was not in our best interest, and so the movement happened. We turned to science instead to answer our questions about the universe. The only problem with this was that we grouped in many things with superstition that we probably shouldn't have. Things like consciousness, intuition, human connection, paranormal phenomenon. All of it went right out of the door with superstition, when in fact we've proven these things today to be real. So after 200 years of just going with the same idea about what's classified as superstition and what's okay to talk about, mainstream science is still going with the assumption that consciousness is just a part of the brain. They don't know how it works, they don't have a single rational explanation for it, but they keep on believing it. Why? Well, when we tossed superstition out of the door, even talking about it became taboo. It's just not done. Literally, the reason that it's tough talking about this stuff in the mainstream scientific community is because that's just the way science has been for 200 years. They won't have any of it, even though there are scientific institutions that prove that theory wrong. The field of noetics and the works of biologist Rupert Sheldrake and his colleagues have more than proven mass consciousness exists and is definitely not a part of the brain. Now, no disrespect to the scientific community, but that assumption that we're still holding onto has not gotten us anywhere. It's time we begin to question the decisions of our ancestors, because many of the things that we've been led to believe to be true simply is not. I'm not saying blindly accept all of the new stuff that's coming out nowadays, but we should at least put it on the table and be able to discuss it as a global community. An apocalypse is a disclosure of something hidden from the majority of mankind in an era dominated by falsehood and misconception. If you haven't seen Lesson 10 already, you should probably watch that one first. This lesson builds on what we covered last time, the phi ratio in particular. Today, we're going to be looking at another way that humans grow through phi. Instead of looking at phi inside the body, we're going to be looking at phi outside the body, and what it means for us in this pivotal point in human history. One other thing before we get this rolling. I want to give an overview about what sacred geometry really is. Sacred geometry is the geometry of consciousness. It revolves around the idea that all consciousness, including human, is solely based on sacred geometry. Because it is, we can begin to see and understand where we have come from, where we are now, and where we're going. Do you remember the fruit of life? This is the basis of all 13 informational systems that come out of the flower of life, the creation pattern of everything. The first system created the platonic solids, which created structure throughout the universe. The second system was the basis of how vibration, sound, harmonics, music, and matter are all interrelated in all of creation. Today, we will look at the third system. The fruit of life will reveal itself in the process. We'll call this system the circles and squares of human consciousness. It is what the Chinese called circling the square and squaring the circle. Remember when we discussed the platonic solids in Lesson 6? I explained that there are five shapes from which all shapes and matter in existence come from and form into. I showed you that all of them will sit perfectly within a sphere, each with every corner touching the sphere perfectly. Well, there's one other shape that can do that. It's a characteristic that only one of the platonic solids have, making it special. It is the cube, which you can put every single platonic solid inside, and an edge or point will touch the inside of the cube perfectly. Through truncating the cube in different ways, you can create all of the other shapes. Because of this characteristic, it essentially means that the cube is like the father of all shapes. It is a male form. And the sphere is the mother of all shapes. It is a female form. All levels of consciousness in the universe are integrated by a single image in sacred geometry. It is the key to space, time, and dimension, as well as consciousness itself. Each level is a geometric image or lens that spirit looks through to see the one reality, resulting in a completely different experience. In the case of humans, this image is the circle and square. This is what Leonardo da Vinci was doing when he drew this drawing, and I'm going to show you what this circle and square combination mean. If you put a circle inside a square perfectly, and then continue to put another circle and square, each with the same diameter, one radius away on all sides, going outwards, you get a drawing that looks like this. You'll notice that with the first circle and square, they fit perfectly within the other. This also happens with the second circle and square. However, then the squares begin penetrating circles. The male form begins interacting with the female form. Why is this important? Well, the circles and squares begin to equate the phi ratio. See, when the circumference of a circle and the perimeter of the square are equal, this equates the phi ratio. So as you can see on this diagram, on the fourth square and the fifth circle, it begins to create the phi ratio. It's close, but not perfect. It's only a 0.6 difference. 
I'm measuring in radii, by the way. The inner circle has a radius of one, so it's two radii across. The next is four, and then six, eight, ten, and so on. Anyways, so the one we just looked at makes a close phi ratio, and then it moves out of sync, staying out of sync for a bit, and then bam. Again, it moves into yet another phi ratio. This time, the difference is only 0.52, even closer to perfection than before. This will continue on forever. If you were to continue this drawing outwards to infinity, each time it would go into sync, drop out of sync for a few circles and squares, but then eventually hit phi again closer than it did the last time. Right now, there are three primary levels of consciousness that we are going to be talking about. They are essentially who we were, who we are, and who we will be. We'll call it the first, second, and third, so that it's easy to understand what we're talking about. The ancient Egyptians were very concerned with these three levels as well, and much of their culture was based on this information. Each of these levels has their own geometric lens too, which look like this. We'll come back to these soon. This is the first level of consciousness, and this is the third. We are on neither of these two phi levels on this circle and square chart. Where we are, the second level of consciousness, is here. We are on the fifth square relative to the sixth circle. For quite a while now, I've been saying that we're at a disharmonic level, and it's something that we're passing through as a species. Now you begin to see the bigger picture of what I meant. The reason it's disharmonic is because it does not equate a phi ratio, not even close. Disharmonic levels are important because they bridge a gap between the divine, pure levels. However, when a species is here, it has to get in and get out as fast as possible, or else they will destroy themselves and everything around them incredibly quickly. You can see this happening all around the world today, because we're at the very end of it, and everything is crashing down on us. We've discussed this all before, notably in the intros of Lesson 1 and 2. So, the reason that we're on this circle and square combination, and not the six square relative to some other circle, is because of this. If you take the square and rotate it 45 degrees, it actually creates a bridge. It connects us from two harmonic levels of being. We're moving from one state of being to the other, this time even closer to source. This is a very exciting time for us. Oh, let me show you this too. This is how the Great Pyramid is set up. This chamber here is called the King's Chamber. If you cut the Great Pyramid horizontally at the King's Chamber, which was the main initiation chamber, and rotate the top half 45 degrees, it makes the exact same image as our level of consciousness. There's a reason for that. The Great Pyramid is the key instrument in allowing humans to reach the third level of consciousness, both as a species and individually. In fact, that's part of the reason why the Great Pyramids were created in the first place. Let's talk more about these levels, though. So what Leonardo was drawing was actually the first level of consciousness. See how he hid lines in this drawing? If you complete this grid, it creates an 8x8 grid. This is the same 64 square grid found on the first level. Measuring in radii, this grid is 8 by 8. However, the circle has 10 radii across, so we'll call this first level an 8 by 10. This is where we were. According to Thoth, an ascended master who has provided much of this information with us, the first level is the first time self-aware consciousness began. The second level has 10 squares across the large square, and a 12 radii circle, so we'll call it a 10 by 12. This is where we are now. This level is the third level, which is also called Christ consciousness. It is a 14 by 18. Now, there's always a reason for everything in sacred geometry. Nothing, absolutely nothing, happens without a reason. Everything is connected. Out of the whole spectrum of possibilities, why did self-aware human consciousness begin when the fourth square went into harmony with the fifth circle? Well, let's overlay the fruit of life over our first level for a second. Look at that! It exactly fits the fourth square and fifth circle perfectly. Do you see the perfection of life? The fruit of life pattern was hidden beneath this pattern all along. They're precisely superimposed over the other. In a right brain way, this is how to explain why consciousness first became self-aware between the fourth square and fifth circle. This sacred image was part of the pattern. The fruit of life was completed at the precise moment that the phi ratio first appeared, and when phi appeared, consciousness had a way to manifest in a new way. Throughout time, many scholars have tried to figure out the secret meaning behind what Leonardo meant with the Vitruvian man drawing. He was showing us human consciousness. This is where we were, the first level. There is a man who did draw our level, though. Da Vinci was studying the works of a man named Vitruvius, who lived 1400 years before Da Vinci, hence the name Vitruvian Man. Vitruvius actually drew his own drawing of consciousness as well, and this is what it looked like. The circle and squares in this one are hidden, less obvious than the Da Vinci drawing. Regardless, they're there, and this is the current circle and square combination around our bodies. This drawing also contains the exact proportions of the Merkaba, which is an important energy system outside of the body, similar to how chakras are an energy system inside the body. This image also contains the diamond that perfectly contains the man from head to feet. This is the same image we saw in the consciousness chart, as well as the Great Pyramid. Further proof that this was what Vitruvius was demonstrating to us when he created this image. So here we have drawings of the first two levels of consciousness. From what I know, there is no drawing of a third. If there is, it's sealed up, locked away somewhere, and is probably one of the most sacred drawings in existence. All right, 
I know talking about geometry all the time can be a little daunting. So many circles and ratios and everything. If this is something you want to learn more about, I am providing the Flower of Life books and PDFs in the comments. This information is found at the very beginning of Volume 2, and much, much more. I could probably do four or five lessons about the geometries of the human body and still not run out of things to talk about, but it's there for you if you want to learn more now. For the last portion of today's lesson, we're going to talk about some recent findings in modern science. As we just saw in the geometry, we are currently in a disharmonic state of being, but we are just about done with it. In doing so, we are moving into a new state of being. We are transferring from the second level of consciousness to the third, also called Christ consciousness. If we look at evolution in Earth's history, we always seem to make random jumps. There are always missing links in the evolutionary chain. Scientists say that we just haven't found all the fossils, and creationists say that God did it, and therefore it's part of some divine plan. But looking at what we just learned about consciousness, does it not make sense that evolution and creationism are just two sides of the same coin? Consciousness moves through different states of being, constantly moving closer and closer to divinity, to phi. Every time it reaches a new stage, it makes a rapid biological change into something new, like what we're doing now. This is what the ancient Egyptians called resurrection, which we mentioned in Lesson 7. So, if we're really going through an evolution of consciousness, what's happening inside of us? Surely, this would mean that there are also biological changes happening to us at our core level, right? Does modern science see any big changes that they're afraid to tell the general public because they think it will cause a panic? Short answer, yes. Long answer, we are changing. Right now, as you're watching this, your DNA is mutating. See, in the last few months, modern medicine has finally accepted publicly that a child was born with three DNA strands rather than two. In a simplified way of seeing it, we are adding an entirely new strand to our DNA, going from a double helix to a triple helix. This wasn't discovered recently, though. In fact, scientists have been studying this for almost 10 to 20 years now. Several years ago in New Mexico, there was a convention of geneticists from all over the world with the main topic of discussion being DNA mutations. Scientists acknowledge that we are changing, but the end result they do not know. Through sacred geometry, we begin to actually see where we could be going. From what our DNA tells us is that long ago we had 12 strands of DNA activated, and then for some reason, 10 of them turned off, and today we consider these to be junk DNA. This is why we have a double helix and not 12-stranded helix. Essentially, 97% of our DNA is unused. But they're slowly being activated, though, so right now we are going from 2 to 3. But eventually we will get back to 12, and then beyond that. With 12 strands activated, you have 10 times as much information available to you than you do with just two strands, as we do now. Not only that, but the 12 strands work in sync with the 12 chakras, providing an immense amount of energy into the body. We are about to become super beings, enabling us to understand and do things that currently seem paranormal, bizarre, or downright impossible. From the article The Bigger Picture by Suzanne Thorpe Clark, we are being changed physically from carbon-based beings to crystalline-based beings. This is interesting, because I've actually heard this from various channelings now, ascension and transformation into crystalline at our core. First the psychics were telling us this, and now we have science backing it up. What we know for sure is that we are going through a shift. Today, I want to close with this. In almost every ancient text and Bible, it speaks about a great shift and awakening. The Bible speaks about the coming of Christ. This is interesting, actually, because Christ is the name of the third level of consciousness. I didn't just make that up. We are moving into Christ consciousness. Which means not that Jesus is going to show up with a big A, but we are actually moving into the level of conscious understanding that Jesus had. It is the coming of Christ through the human species. Now who's pumped for 2012?